Hello everyone, today we're taking a look at Shark Bite. Yeah, uh, this little old channel got a Shark Bite. I tried to buy one, but I missed out. But thankfully, I had an advocate on my side, uh, Dumb Thumbs FPV. Thank you very much, sir. He was an advocate for me over on RC Groups. And he seems to be playing a role in the development or in kind of the direction, not necessarily of everything within this system, but uh, he has contributed to mainly this one thing of uh, making sure we got a whoop board. And I want to also thank Carl from DiviMath. He sent this to me. I tried to buy one from GetFPV during their limited quantities, but I missed out. Uh, and with Dumb Thumb FPV's help, as well as Carl being very gracious, I was able to get my hands on one, and Carl sent that right away. So I've been having some fun lately. This has probably been covered quite a bit by other people. I've seen the thumbnails. I've seen several videos from Joshua Bardwell and from Albert Kim. I'm sure there are many of you others that have. I've seen some flight footage. Um, kind of various sorts as well. So uh, I don't know what has been covered and what hasn't because I haven't really studied those. But let's take a look. I put this in a whoop. I'm a micro guy. So I put the whoop board in a whoop and I flew it around the house. Uh, one of the things that I might show you that you might not have seen yet is LED gates through it. Uh, I also fly inside my house. I know no one else has showed you the inside of my house through it because no one else in my house flies FPV. Well, we're going to do the typical things of flying it outside and just kind of having some fun and taking a look. We take these goggles off, we'll get down to the desk, we'll take a closer look at this component, and then we'll move on to the flight footage. So this is the board I was sent, it's number 12. Um, I don't know how deep to go into this, I don't want to waste your time. Basically there's a connection down here, you use that to connect it to your VTX, and you can update when updates become available. There's also a smaller port down here, and there's a little joystick that you connect to that, and you can change settings that way, or uh, you, you can do that with your radio stick commands through the OSD as well. I put this in and I didn't get any activity. I could change channels, but I couldn't get into the camera settings. And uh, Dumb Thumbs FPV said, well, you might have bent one of those pins like I did. And you have to straighten it out with an X-Acto knife. So I went the OSD route because uh, I couldn't get mine to work. Not saying it's damaged, not saying it doesn't work, but it's definitely possible that I messed it up because it is a very small connector. I'm going to remove this cable and we'll take a little finer look. Of course, we've got a UFL connector on there. Now, this isn't the final iteration to my knowledge. There are pictures online uh, on the in the RC Groups thread, and I'll link that down below, as well as uh, Dumb Thumbs FPV. He has a YouTube channel called Man Cave Hobbies. I'll link that down below. You see where we have these breakouts across the side. I think that's going to stay but I saw a picture where there were two holes in the middle of the board so that you could take your antenna, lay it over, and then you could run a zip tie through there to help secure your antenna down. That might be good, especially for uh, protecting the UFL connector and hard bumps and crashes. Uh, but these are our main wire connectors over here. I'm shooting from the hip a little bit because I can't quite read those. I believe it's ground, uh, voltage, uh, RX and TX. RX and TX are swapped on the board, so RX here goes to TX on the board, and TX here goes to RX on the board. Uh, of course, you need to have a spare UART, of course, to get that stuff working. Uh, I found it fairly seamless and easy to use, so I did that. Uh, I did use a capacitor on my board, a tiny little capacitor. It's a 10 volt, 470 microfarad capacitor, as you see there in that pre-recorded video. That was just a safeguard. I've only got one of these, and I know they're kind of hard, hard to get a hold of, so that was something I was doing just in case. It's not necessarily required. I do think they suggest if you run anything over 4S to uh, have a capacitor on there permanently. I think they also encourage you, if you're doing like bench testing with it, to have a capacitor as well to kind of even out the voltage spikes a little bit. And here is a look at the bottom side of the board as well for all those people that have that fine eye for all these little components. I'm really pleased in two components. That we have this, well, and I'm biased. I love micros, I love whoops. And I think this is going to be the board of choice. Of course, that other stack, the 20 by 20, much larger, heavier stack, that might be serviceable in larger quads, even three inch quads. But I suspect this board is going to be going in most micros, probably four inch or less, really. And I'm also very pleased that this module, which I guess technically isn't a module, it's the uh, VRX, I believe it's called, is so compact. Uh, one thing about this I worried about was, you know, originally when it came out, it had a ground station, essentially, that you had to connect it to. That was the Byte Frost system. Uh, this is much more compact, pretty seamless. You've got an HDMI cable down here that connects your, to your goggles to it. Uh, this is the port you connect 
Oh, not that port. This port too for firmware updates. I don't believe there are any updates for this yet. At least there's none officially listed on the website. I think Carl has sent out a few updates according to what I've read on RC groups for people uh, using bite frost systems and maybe having a little bit of cross-platform compatibility issues. And then right underneath the cable is where our uh, micro SD card is right here. One thing I'd hope to show you that I won't be able to show you, so I'll do a follow-up video. And if you have suggestions for follow-up videos, I wanted to use my Orca goggles just to see what it's like using that experience. Unfortunately, the cable that I bought, I got noticed just today that it's not going to make it here till December. So I quickly went on to Amazon and ordered the next available cable that was going to be serviceable. It's going to be a little bit too long. I think I'm going to have to do something with foam taping this on the front of those goggles or something, but uh, it should be here in about three or four days. You know, prime shipping isn't quite the two-day shipping it used to be. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. I, I did buy HDO2 goggles just for the purpose of this. I, I figured uh, Fat Shark Carl sent me this VRX and the VTX and the camera for nothing. The very least I can do is pay him back with uh, a purchase of HDO2s. Plus, to get a feel for it, I thought I needed to fly it or or use what this had been intended to use for. It's not that you can't use it with anything with HDMI. You can plug it into a TV. But I wanted to use it with the goggles that this was designed for. And I thought that's the most valid way I can take a look at this. Of course, the camera's a 14 by 14 millimeter mounting pattern. This cable length appears to be 80 millimeters, which is what they list in the specs as well. My number 12 board with a whip antenna or linear antenna weighs seven grams. The camera with the cable weighs five grams. We put that all together for 12 grams. We add the little mounting adapter that I needed to use inside the canopy that I have in my whoop for a grand total of 12.6 grams. The whoop that I'm flying it on is a 70 5 millimeter 2s 1103 8000 kv with gym fan 40 millimeter quad bladed props i have got the ae65 canopy that i reamed out in order to fit that camera lens through there you can see it sticks out quite a little bit and there you can see my little capacitor as well and the dry weight of that quad with the shark bite system is 45 grams I've selected this flight to show you first because I fly not only inside the house, but I flow outside the house. And I think it's the quickest way for you to get a fix of how it appears in my environment. You may have seen uh, camera videos and other flight videos. Uh, keep in mind that the board I've got in this little whoop is the Crazy Bee F4 Pro, the version 3, which does have an integrated a D8 mode receiver. So I don't have a long range receiver on here, but you get an idea, you know, I'm sitting inside the house at the table and I've flown around the outside of the house, which has a brick face on the outside. Uh, we get some breakup, but I'm think as I go around to the other side, the breakup's gonna get a little bit more severe and my radio is just hollering out, uh, RSSI critical, RSSI critical. I really expected it to just fall out of the air at any moment, uh, but I turned around and come back into the house. Uh, I think in this video, we got a breeze kind of kicking through that doorway there uh, as well. So now we're just going to go inside the house and fly around a little bit. I enjoyed this, but I enjoy a lot of different things. And I think one thing that is a little bit disturbing to me is there are going to be strong opinions on both sides of the spectrum. You might be comparing this to uh, the DJI system. I'm not necessarily comparing it to the DJI system because I think the scope is quite a bit different. Uh, my understanding is that Fat Shark has, well, actually other manufacturers have several cameras coming out for the Shark Bite system. So I think that makes it different. I think it makes it different in that it's analog compatible. So if you have analog friends, they'll be able to fly at the same time. You won't knock them out of the air. I think the price point of getting into this system, especially if you're already invested in analog, is going to be substantially different. Uh, matter of fact, the Get uh, FPV pre-order page just went up today, so you can go to Get FPV and pre-order your own. I think the price is somewhere around $350. This initial system that they had out and available for people, I think was intended for bite frost uh, purchasers. I think the link got out or something. I don't know. It's really hard for me to make heads or tails. I was reading a lot of this stuff in RC groups, and many of you might contribute to RC groups. Unfortunately, I don't make it over there. with a, I'm so busy with other things. But uh, So I was trying to kind of piece together. You probably need to go read it for yourself and get your own take. But that's a couple of little highlights on differences. You know, you're not locked in. It seems as though Fat Shark is going to make... 
uh, this system and then allow other camera developers to come in and do their own thing, which is going to be good because the more companies you get involved, the more they compete and then, you know, they got to keep up with each other. If one's make made some sort of grand improvement, the others better do it as well or they won't be able to compete. And that's good for us. Um, and it's also exciting to me because you've got this little tiny board. Some people are doing naked vistas. I'm a little bit hesitant on that because of the whole heat factor. There could be a durability issue. I know several of you have told me that you're, you're doing naked vistas and it works just fine. But this is another option, whether it's an equal option or an option for you or not. That's up for you to decide. I enjoy myself. Oh, yeah. And another crash. I know some of you like for my videos to end in a crash. And this one has. Let's move on to some other flight footage. Uh, let's stay in the house and go to the LED gates. Uh, before we get started with the shark bite system, this is how it looks in analog. So this is the Runcam Nano 3 with the second, or yeah, the Runcam Nano 3 on the Uzi 65 with that second version of the lens that has that kind of notchy lens to it. And this is on analog and I'm sitting downstairs. Uh, oftentimes I'll get questions about my video reception. You can see how much more it breaks up if I sit downstairs. So if you're flying analog in your house and you're having video reception issues, uh, move around is the best suggestion I can make for you. But I wanted to give you a sample of what it looks like uh, in analog before I showed you the shark bite system. Uh, it gives you kind of a baseline. It's one of the one-to-one comparisons I can make. But you can see we've got pretty consistent flashing and you might be wondering why that is. I could probably help this by using a circular polarized antenna on the quad. Of course, that's going to add weight. Back in my shop, I sit right next to the heating and air system. So I've got all that tin and that metal. Whenever that kicks on, there's got to be some sort of electrical noise coming out of that machinery. I don't, I don't know that to be certain. It's just a suspicion of mine. And so that's one of the reasons why the video reception isn't very good back there. So we're going to fly out of my shop area and we're going to go out to the LED gates. And you get to see that. Now, initially, when I passed through the gates in the goggles, I felt like a flash or something in my eyes that I got used to. Uh, this is probably my fifth flight. I'm trying to show you my best flight. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's just, it's just something that I got used to. I think as you pass through those LED gates that are pretty good and bright, that there's just something with the camera or something that uh, it, it kind of creates that flash. But again... I think I noticed it my first two flights, but by this point, I was kind of not noticing it anymore. So something to note, not a big deal, at least in my opinion, but it's information that I could pass along to you. Something that I did notice in the goggles. Flying around upstairs, of course, this is mainly because it's really dark. We've got an oversink light on, and then we've got an under counter light on. So that area is super dark, and it's all the way dark outside. This is about uh, 1030 at night. Everybody is in bed, and so daddy's having a little bit of fun. Uh, flying some gates and missing some gates. One of my pathway gates, the USB uh, power, the USB battery bank kind of went dead on me. So instead of circling those three gates, uh, only two. I do have other gates coming up, uh, but that'll probably be it, it'll be four or five days yet. But uh, these gates are Mobili gates, uh, Mobili.com or MobiliGates.com. I'll put a link down in the video description. You, you can also pick them up from GoodVentureDrones.com. This is a flight out back. Many of you have probably seen this area and all the glorious leaves I talked about in that last Savage Bee, you can kind of see where we've worked. Uh, well, we got more leaves that have fell, but <laughs> if you're interested in studying where we did try to pick up the leaves, you can kind of make out how far across the yard we got. We got the front done, but we did not get the back anywhere near close. Uh, so we'll be working on that again this weekend. Hopefully I'll have time to edit this video and get that out uh, before I get stuck uh, doing leaf work with my 15-year-old. It's a really calm day, and this was the second day that I got that was really calm. The first day, I kind of was in a hurry because I was really concerned. Uh, the weather report showed three miles an hour, and for whoop flying, that's great in my area. Uh, so I quickly went out, threw a dirty tune on it, and went out and flew it. And I can show you a little bit of that because it's out front. Maybe there's something out front that's uh, interesting that you want to see. But this is this is later, so this tune is actually a little bit better than the tune that I had previously. Um, I worked on it inside a little bit when I was doing the LED gate flying and then uh, just generally improved it uh, in small increments over the course of, of the flights. Uh, my main focus, of course, was getting the shark bite system up and running. Man, you can see all those leaves. It's crazy. 
I thought this pass along the back fence was fairly interesting because the sun is relatively low this time of year, even though I think it's probably close to about 1, 1 30 in the afternoon. But the sun kind of comes through all those slats in the, in the fence. And then as you fly by that, you can get an idea of how that appears and you can compare that to, to other cameras or other flying. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a bark inspection on the trees. Uh, we're going to do sun and shade, but on two different kinds of trees. So the bark is going to appear a little bit different. This is something I could have done by just walking around, but uh, walking isn't nearly as much fun as flying. Of course, this isn't a range test. Uh, I don't do a range test. I would suspect range is something that has been really well covered by this point. Uh, but I don't really do rangy stuff. I've done a couple of four-inch um, long rangers, but that it's not common for me to do that. Mainly, I like to fly close to home, and uh, I just thought for this channel, this was most appropriate. Look at if you look, find a tree with a little bit of leaves, especially in my neighbor's yard, there is that three mile an hour wind, but it's it's really really calm. There's a little like a puff of air that you can feel every once in a while when you're sitting there flying. But generally, it's really calm. And I thought this footage came out pretty good as far as the stability so that you could study it and you could see the different lines that I have in my space. And you could compare that or just kind of do a visual inspection. Maybe by this point in the video, you know, 10 minutes in or what have you, uh, you've already seen enough and moved on. But uh, I, with a system like this and all the flying that I've done in my space... I thought it would give you a pretty good idea to compare it to pretty much everything else is out, out there in the market, including those HD cameras that have onboard recording. Uh, so you, you can click around on the channel and look at various quads or components or cameras and, and kind of do your own comparison. You know, if you've got uh, two browser windows open or something that you can do a uh, side-by-side -side comparison, uh, you might want to do that. But I think putting it, actually pitting it one against another, you know, whether it's analog versus the shark bite or shark bite versus dji i see them as different i i kind of lean towards the thought that this is the beginning of the end of analog uh, but i'm pretty happy with what i'm seeing i'm pretty happy with the size the compact i'm pretty happy if the price point that they're showing on the uh, pre-order page for get fpv is you know going to be the price point that's pretty good uh, i think it makes it digital fpv much more attainable for a larger group especially with this swoop board i, I think a lot of us are going to be wanting to run twigs and, and toothpicks and and hoops and three inchers and we're going to want to do all sorts of fun stuff when this thing really hits the market and starts running wild of course a couple of different cameras come out of the market that'll be exciting as well so this is out front uh doing a little typical camera test i've got a blue cloth this time look at that pretty blue and I'm trying to get the <laughs> cloth directly on the lens to cover it completely. You can see I struggle a little bit with that. Uh, but we're going to do the three different length of tests that I typically do with cameras and pointing them at the sun about a foot and a half away from the camera lens, as far as my arm can reach from the camera lens and right up on the camera lens. I thought that was something I had nearly forgotten to do. Uh, but it's it's an important aspect of FPV is how quickly does the lens respond to light changes. Now this is my original outside flight. You'll have to ignore the voltage warning. Um, <laughs> I did not have the scaling and I still don't have the amperage scaling right. I need to work on that some more. You saw in the other flight footage where I did get the voltage right. So <laughs> this, this is going to look odd. Betaflight thinks I have a three cell in this. I do not. I have a little 2S 450 milliamp battery inside there and we're just going to fly it around the neighborhood. This mainly because when I do my camera comparisons, I mainly I mainly fly out front of the house. It's a larger space. I have different views. It has more sun. It also has shade that I can fly through and around. Uh, I do like to look at the, my neighbor's red cars. And the front just gives us more variance in what we can look at to you know, see how the camera and system responds or, or how it looks in our eyes. And I think this is one of those things where it's going to be different for everyone. Some people will probably love it. Some people probably will not be as excited. And some people will probably be all about uh, how disappointed they are in the system. Le leave your opinion down below. Of course, you know, I run a family-friendly channel. So leave your opinion. And, uh, doing it without using any colorful language, please. Uh, any 
colorful language comments. Unfortunately, I will have to delete those. I have three kids, and I just don't want to be a part of anything that I wouldn't have them be a part of. And uh, cursing is one of those things I don't think they need to be a part of. I, my personal feeling on it is cursing is it's not something I'm against. I have cursed at my own kids. I have cursed at the kids I've coached. Uh, but it's something that I very rarely do, and it's something that gets that immediate attention where they know, whoa, this is serious, because he doesn't say that. Um, so otherwise, uh, cursing just kind of feels like you're an inability to explain ourselves. So take some time uh, if you have some very strong feelings and, and leave your opinion down below. I'm not afraid of anyone's opinion. We can definitely disagree and we can agree. I, I know that everybody's not the same. And I respect everyone's opinion because we each have our own opinion and that's what's most important. Fly what you want to fly. Be excited about what you want to be excited about. We are flying essentially toys. I know some people are making a living at it, but most of us, 99.9% .9 of us, we're flying for fun. And so whatever we spend our money on, we need to be having fun with that money that's spent. Uh, what is it? It's Team Black Sheep, I think. They, they say uh, serious toys. Yeah, they're serious toys. They're serious fun toys. If there are other things you would like to do that you think I'm capable in my space to show this uh, system off in another way, uh, please let me know down in the comment section as well. I can sure do some more. Uh, we've gotten some nice days, but winter is supposed to be setting in. We already had one snow, like, it was a month ago, I think, we already had a snow. Uh, I know some people have, you know, harsher weather than we do, uh, but eventually it will set in, so flying outside isn't something that I'll be doing a lot of. Um, and I guess that's something I should mention that for upcoming reviews, for upcoming reviews, um, my flights won't be as frequent. So typically when I do a quad review, I I'll fly something over the course of, say, two weeks and I might put in 50. It might only be 30, but somewhere between 30 and 70 flights before I post a review. Wintertime reviews, you know, they're it, it's going to be a more uncomfortable outside, so I'll probably only fly them maybe 15 times eh, before I post a review on it, because 15 times will probably be two weeks. Oh, it's going to die right here. Yeah, I ran the battery too low because I wasn't trusting the voltage meter, and then it just, I could feel it on the sticks. It's not going to take off. So that which, that's what you see when the board or the camera won't power up. <laughs> that's not to be surprising. Everything's fine. So what do you think? What do you think if you've seen on the internet in general? What do you think of this system? I'm looking at the price point. I think I alluded to it so far in the video, but I'm seeing the price point. It can vary depending upon the options, which board you choose. Uh, the price point, somewhere in the 300s. Uh, 319, I think, will get you a package with this board. I don't think it comes with an antenna, though. So that's something that you might prepare. But these antennas, I must have a bin full of these from... I don't know, somewhere just over the time. So you, you shouldn't have to spend more than a couple of dollars on an antenna. And there's nothing special about the one that I'm using. It was just one that was somewhat stiff, but yet an overly stiff that was in my bin. So if you haven't already, leave your comment down in the comment section. Let me know what you think. I'm sure Fat Shark and Carl from Divi Math will be taking a look, maybe. I guess I shouldn't say I'm sure. I would think they would. I don't know what revision this is. Again, this is board number 12. And that's about as far as I can go as telling you what this is. I noticed within the uh, OSD menu there weren't any firmware numbers. So if, if there is a way to see the firmware on the camera, on the board, on the VRX, uh, please let me know. I would think there would be a way, but I just haven't found it. But I might not be the sharpest tool in the shed either. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, or otherwise, please let me know. In the section down below, I appreciate your time. I'll be doing the Orca Goggle soon. Thanks for watching.